So without further ado, I want to welcome and present Robert Sunday. Thank you so much. I have to ask your pardon if I am a little bit distracted tonight, a little bit of a family crisis. Uh, I just heard from back home that my brother, he, uh, he thinks he's a moth. And he uh, actually ran this evening into a dentist's office. And he said to the dentist, Doc, I think I'm a moth. And the dentist said, well, you need a psychologist. You don't need a dentist. What are you doing in my office? And my brother said, your light was on. And that, I think, encapsulates, in a nutshell, the age of absurdity and enforced unreality that we live in, when we have our governments and the people who are elected to represent and protect us saying, yes, he's a moth, and if you don't think so, you're in serious trouble. And this is what happened to me at the airport uh, a few days ago. I came in, I gave another talk. Uh, over somewhere else a few days ago and uh, was flying in on Thursday into the Toronto airport and we were three hours there while uh, most of it was waiting but some of the questions were uh, very interesting in light of this age of absurdity and unreality that we live in. I didn't know, they didn't tell me, they said we were, we're, there's going to be a little delay, we're running some checks and I said what kind of checks? And the answer was so we waited for these checks. <laughs> and finally, they uh, called us over, and they're going through everything. They're going through everything that I have. And so I, uh, I had some prescriptions. And you know, with the prescriptions, there comes a description from the drugstore, from the pharmacy, about uh, all the whatever, the contraindications and the, you know, the molecular structure and everything. And the guy's reading it very closely and turning the page, and I think you're that, if, if you're so interested in that, why aren't you a pharmacist? <laughs> and he's going through the Quran every page, and I thought, oh, now you're getting to the hate speech. <laughs> but he wasn't really interested in the Quran, what the Quran said, he was interested that I had these papers in here, uh, notes from talks past, where I jot down a few things that I want to remember to say, and he's scanning every one of these, where's the hate speech? And I didn't know, actually, at that time, that that was what he was looking for. It wasn't until uh, one of his colleagues came by and he said, uh, uh, So, JDL. And I said, Yeah. And that was that. Yeah. And then he says, Have you ever spoken in Europe? And I said, Yes, not really where. And so I started listing off the countries I've spoken in most of the countries in Europe at one time or another. And I get to Germany and he says, You spoke in Germany? And I said, Yeah. I, in Germany, and he said, oh, I'm surprised, because they have very strict hate speech laws. <laughs> now, it was clear then what that was all about, and what they were looking for, and why they're searching through my socks and everything. <laughs> they're looking for the hate speech. And they took down, by the way, the address of every place that I was speaking, the time I was speaking, so I want to give a greeting to the Trudeau government official who's here tonight. <laughs> I'd like to stand up and be acknowledged. Uh, But all this is just as absurd as my brother who thinks he's a moth. And it is no less absurd than that. And so it starts off as a little joke, except it's deadly serious. The idea that it would be hate speech to discuss the difficulty, the problems that are coming to Canada with the refugees, and the problems that are inherent in Islamic doctrines that are pointed to by Islamic jihadis every day to justify violence and hatred. And that's hate speech. We live in an age that George Orwell would have thought was crazy. And there is absolutely no mitigating that. The problem is, is that day by day as we live in it, we become inured to it. And we become used to it, and it becomes, you know, like the frog in the, the whole story about you want to boil a frog, you don't throw the frog into the boiling water, he'll jump out. You, slow, you throw the frog into the cool water, and he thinks, this is great, I love this. And, oh, it's getting a little warmer, but it's still okay. And it's getting a little warmer, and a little warmer, and a little warmer, until it's far too late. 
you know, I had a very graphic illustration of just how dangerous that process is and how it can sneak up on us without realizing. A couple years back, I was reading a, the diary of Victor Klemper. I don't know if you know Victor Klemper. He's a very fascinating figure from World War II. He was a German Jew in Germany, and he was married to a non-Jew. And so that was the one loophole and exception that enabled him to remain in Germany. He was in Germany through the whole of World War II. And of course, he suffered terrible depredations and hardships and occasional violence, but he survived the war. And he kept a daily diary, which is an extraordinary document of what it was like to live in Nazi Germany. And the, one of the strangest things about it, he's a very interesting character. I highly recommend the books, but in any case, in 1940, and in 1942, he's saying, it's five minutes to midnight, things are getting really bad. And he would think, well, you know, from our standpoint, he would think, well, wait a minute, no, it's, it's 1 a.m., man. It's way past how bad you think it is. But he, in the middle of it, from day to day, you don't realize. And that is the situation that we're in, with this refugee situation that the Prime Minister of Canada can greet at the airport, oddly enough, he wasn't there when I came there, but uh, <laughs> that he could greet at the airport these refugees, and it's being celebrated as this great thing. Well, I hate to be the one to throw the rotting cabbage on the sofa, but I'm going to. There are some problems with this. Some of them we've already heard about, but there's more. In the first place, in February 2015, the Islamic State said, we're going to send 500,000 refugees into Europe. Now, they did not mean, actually, although it would have been well good enough in itself, that they were going to send 500,000 refugees into welfare states and thereby overwhelm the welfare system and collapse the economies. That would have been good enough, but they're going one better. In September, when the actual refugee influx began, and of course anybody who thought that it had anything to do with the Islamic State's boast in February that it was soon going to start sending refugees into Europe was a racist, anti-Muslim bigot. We all know that. It had nothing to do whatsoever with the Islamic State threat when, in September, the refugees started to come. But as soon as they did start to come, then an Islamic State operative said, thank you, we have already gotten 4,000 jihadis into Europe and more coming all the time. And of course, can we put that there? Yeah. They're, they're coming here now. Also, at the same time, around in September and early October, the Lebanese education minister gave an interview in which he said that of the, of the refugees from Syria, who they just crossed over the border into Lebanon, obviously they don't want to stay in Lebanon, they're on their way to Europe and then to North America, some of them. He said that of the Syrian refugees in his country, he estimated that there were 20,000 active Islamic Jihad terrorists. 20,000. And there are also some strange details about these refugees themselves. In the first place, this is supposed to be a refugee crisis from Syria, where there's a war. However, it has been determined that 50% of the refugees are not Syrians. They're Moroccans, they're Algerians, they're Pakistanis, they're any number of the nationalities where there is no war. And there is a brisk black market in forged Syrian passports that they use to get into Europe and to Canada as refugees. Now, why on earth would somebody from Morocco or Algeria decide to get a fake Syrian passport and go into Europe? What on earth would be the objective? Well, let me suggest to you that the answer to that lies deep in Islamic history, back to the origins of Islam. Some of you, I'm sure many of you may know that uh, the year one of the Islamic calendar is a bit counterintuitive. You know that in the, in the Islamic calendar, we're in the middle of the 15th century, and it start, it's, it's, it, it, the year one is not the birth of Muhammad, and is not the death of Muhammad, and is not when Muhammad became a prophet, what is the year one of the Islamic calendar? The year one of the Islamic calendar is the Hijra. Twelve years after Muhammad began to declare himself a prophet, he emigrated. That's what the word means, emigration. 
Hijra. He moved from Mecca to Medina, and in Medina for the first time, he became a political and military leader as well as a spiritual teacher of spiritual ideas. So, in other words, by the calendar itself, the Islamic tradition is telling us that the Islam is not fully Islam, Islam doesn't really become Islam until it has a political and military extension. And that that came about by means of emigration. Now, in order to understand emigration properly, you have to understand something else about Islam. Islam is all full of threats of hellfire. If you pick up the Quran, and you open it to any page, in the first place you will find a furious denunciation of unbelievers. I challenge you to find any page of the Quran that does not contain a furious denunciation of unbelievers. Many of those pages that denounce unbelievers furiously are telling them how they're going to be roasted in hell, and as soon as their skins are burnt away, Allah will issue them new skins so that he can torture them further. How do you escape hellfire? In the Quran, it says that if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, this is chapter 21, verse 47, if you'd like to look it up, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll go into paradise. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you'll go to hell. How much do your deeds weigh? How many good deeds have you done? How many bad deeds have you done? How does anybody know? And so that very criterion creates more fear that every Muslim who is pious and knowledgeable and afraid of hell is going to think, I could very well go to hell just based on my living my life day to day because I may have committed more bad deeds than good or my bad deeds might outweigh my good ones. And I just don't know. However, there are two places where there's a little bit of a guarantee. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. I mean, let's go into jail. This, this one goes up. You go straight to paradise. And that is in chapter 9, verse 111, which says that paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed for Allah. And that's why people strap on suicide vests and blow themselves up in crowds of infidels, because they know if they kill some infidels and they get killed in the process, they're in. No worries about hellfire. Where's the other? Chapter 4, verse 100. Chapter 4, verse 100 says, He who emigrates, he who emigrates, in the way of Allah, will find in the earth enough room for refuge, like in Canada, and plentiful resources. And he who goes forth from his house as a migrant in the way of Allah and his messenger, and whom death overtakes, his reward becomes incumbent upon Allah. His reward becomes incumbent upon Allah. See, if you leave your country and go to a new country in the cause of Allah, not just to go get a new job, a better job, and, and a nice house, courtesy the welfare system. If you go and emigrate in the cause of Allah, then your reward is incumbent upon him. He owes it to you to give you your reward, to go to paradise. And so you're all set. Now, what does it mean to emigrate in the cause of Allah? Well, that, therein lies another story. A few years back, there was a controversy in Minnesota about... A, uh, a school called the Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy. And the Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy was a public school, so it got publicly public money from Department of Education or whoever. And a public school in the United States, of course, is not supposed to be teaching any religion. But the Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy was in a building with a mosque. All the students were Muslims. They stopped for prayers. They studied Quran. It was not an ordinary public school. Well, maybe it's a public school circa 2025 or 2050, but not, not now. So, there was a controversy about it, and the Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy was ultimately closed. Okay, great. One thing that was interesting, though, was that nowhere in any of the coverage of all this controversy did anybody ever say, hey, who was Tariq Ibn Zayed? Why did they name the school after him? You know, why did they call it John Dewey Academy? Buckminster Fuller School. What, who's Tariq Ibn Zayed? Is he some great Islamic educator? No. Tariq Ibn Zayed was one of the conquerors of Spain. And he's famous for landing on the beach in Spain and ordering the boats burned. And they said, what are you doing burning the boats? And he said, we're going to take this land and Islamize it or we're going to die here. 
Because remember, if you die in the new land, Allah, the reward from Allah is incumbent upon you. So, Tarek ibn Zayed was all about emigrating to a new land and conquering it for Islam. And nobody seemed to know or care that that's what they, well, the, who they named the school after, but that's a hint as to what emigration in the cause of Allah is all about. And so, when emigration in the cause of Allah is going on, then the idea is to bring Islamic law and to subjugate the non-Muslims under its rule because Islamic law denies equality of rights to non-Muslims. And that is the goal of it. Now, is this refugee crisis a hijra? Is it an emigration in the cause of Allah? Well, in the first place, we not only have the boasts of the Islamic State, we not only have the estimates from the Lebanese education minister, and the fact that several of the refugees in Paris, several of the jihadis in Paris, rather, were refugees who had just come into Europe via Greece in October, made their way to France, and started killing infidels. We not only have all that, but we also have some other salient facts. One of them is that well over 70% of the refugees are young, able-bodied Muslim men between the ages of 18 and 40. Now I ask you, if you lived in a war zone, and you had a wife and children, would you say, honey, I'm going to Europe, good luck. <laughs> Obviously, something fishy is going on there. Obviously, if it were a real refugee crisis, you would take the wife, you would take the kids, you would take grandma, and it would be difficult, but that's what real refugees do. Real refugees are taking refuge. They are fleeing a situation. You don't leave home and, 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 and leave the kids behind under the bombs, unless, of course, that's not really what this is all about. And, of course, more of the unremitting unreality and the endless nonsense and absurdity that we have to swallow is that we don't really have to worry about any of these things that I'm telling you tonight because these people will be vetted. And as has already been pointed out, Tashfin Malik who was one of the shooters who murdered 14 people in San Bernardino on December 2nd, had passed no less than three background checks from the FBI, the DHS, and, and of the FBI and the DHS, yes, Department of Homeland Security. Now, it's not just that these people can evade because they don't have criminal records, it's that there aren't any records at all. In Iraq, the coalition forces kept very careful records. And anybody who was caught, anybody who was identified, they got his picture, they got his name, they got his aliases, they got his fingerprints. He tries to get over here, there's no way. They got the records, they will vet, okay? Right? Relax. So, not too long ago it came out that there were two Iraqis who were living in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And they had come over as refugees and they had been very famous in the Iraqi army during the time that the United States forces had gone in there for murdering American soldiers. And they were heroes and lionized as such for murdering American soldiers. And then they applied for refugee status, and despite their fame, and despite their notoriety, they got in and were settled in in a quiet life in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now that's the guys that they can vet. In Syria, there weren't any coalition forces. In Syria, there are no records. The Canadian army wasn't there, the American army wasn't there, nobody was there. And not only that, but Barack Obama assured us. <laughs> and you know how trustworthy he is. He said, if you like your health plan, you can keep your health plan. And he said that we are going to raise up an army of vetted moderates in Syria. Remember that? Vetted moderates. And so here again, we have the vetting process. We have the vetting process put to the test. We can see, okay, now we, we, we have a chance. We have a little bit of a lab experiment. How did the vetting go, Barack? This is how it went. The United States spent $500 million on vetting the moderates. What they wanted to do was they wanted to find 
able-bodied men who were not affiliated with Al-Qaeda, not affiliated with the Islamic State, that is ISIS, or ISIL as he calls them, not affiliated with any other jihad group, and not affiliated with Bashar Assad, and they would raise up this army of, of pure, ideologically trustworthy moderates, and they would win the day, beat Assad, beat ISIS, everything would be okay. They got 50 guys. <laughs> 50. 500 million dollars on 50 guys. And they spent that's 10 million dollars a man. I mean, you know, I was the guy should sign up. <laughs> Such a deal. You got a new truck, you got the latest weaponry, you got military training, and they, 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 they vetted and trained these people and they sent them into Syria, into the war zone. Can you imagine, I mean, can you imagine even doing that? I tell you, we're living in an age of absolute absurdity. You better believe my brother's a moth, or you're a racist and bigot. And you better believe that 50 people trained by the United States government can go in and settle the situation in Syria. I mean, who would think that? Is Laurel and Hardy running the State Department? So, what a fine mess they've gotten us into, too. These 50 guys, they go into Syria, and immediately they melt away. They were captured, they were killed, or they turned over their material to the Islamic State. Their nice new trucks and all that. And that was it. $500 million down the drain. How many times do you think we can keep doing that sort of thing? Now, this is a testimony to how absolutely useless the idea of vetting is. And the, there's more as well, as you may have expected. The Islamic State, I wrote a book actually, The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS, available now. And The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS actually gave me a strange experience because I've written 14 books and it's a kind of a routine now um, in the way that I work and I've been doing this for many, many years. And also have Jihad Watch at jihadwatch.org, which is news and commentary on jihad activity every day, all this. And I see all this, you know, killing and rape and, and torture and horrible things. And I have to admit that, you know, after a while, you just get sort of inured to it and it doesn't bother me. I read the Islamic State manuals, the ISIS manuals, for what they were going to do in the West. That, was bother that bothered me. It was deeply unnerving. The Islamic State or ISIS. By the way, you know, by the way, that ISIS, ISIL, and the Islamic State are all the same thing. And the crown heads, <laughs> elected heads of the Western governments all refuse to call it by the name that it calls itself, the Islamic State, because they don't want to say that word Islamic. They want to pretend, here again, in more enforced absurdity, that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam. And so they call it by two acronyms that refer to its previous name, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, which is sometimes translated the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, and so you get ISIL or ISIS. Anyway, the Islamic State manuals are very are chilling because they lay out in great detail how they plan to destroy Canada, the United States, Great Britain, Western Europe. They intend to do this by means of getting as many of their people in place as possible. For example, by means of refugee resettlement. And once they're here, they're going to show anybody who's watching that they got nothing to worry about. These people are going to come in and they're going to be absolutely everything we've wished for. And all the leftists are going to point to them and say, see, you bigoted, racist, right-wingers were just fear-mongering and creating hysteria in your zest for hate speech. See, look, they'll say, he's a moth. They'll say, look at him. He doesn't read the Quran. He doesn't go to mosque. He doesn't uh, uh, wear a long beard. He's not wearing a kaftan. He's a grateful, assimilated Canadian citizen loyal to the government, appreciative of secular government, 
happy to be here, grateful for the advantage Canada has given him. You know something? All that is what the Islamic State tells their operatives to do. They say, don't go in and be ostentatious about your Islam. Be a regular guy. Be a Westerner. And so, the idea is, once the time comes, then they will strike. And you see it already happening. Every time there's a strike, the news reports quote all their friends saying, well, I'm just shocked. I'm shocked. I didn't see this coming. You remember how Captain Renault was shocked in Casablanca when he said, uh, I'm shocked, shocked that there's gambling going on here. And then the guy comes up, you're winning, sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and that's how the families are all shocked in these cases. But there is an element of truth to it that the people around them didn't know because they concealed what they were really all about. And the people that might raise alarm among Westerners who are very ostentatious about their Islam are not the Islamic State operatives. The Islamic State operatives are clean-shaven and or maybe wearing a little trim beard and a tie and carrying around a Quran. <laughs> no, I promise, I, I, I will not detonate. Anyway, um, <clears throat> There's another problem with vetting as well, and that is this. In, uh, on October 19th, 2011, 57 Muslim and South Asian organizations wrote a letter to John Brennan. John Brennan was at that time Homeland Security Advisor. Uh, and I don't know the relationship between that and the Homeland Security Secretary, but in any case, he was a high-placed official. And he is now the head of the CIA. And the letter said, you have this guy, Robert Spencer, training FBI agents. And uh, he wrote this book about Muhammad, the, the truth about Muhammad, that portrays Muhammad in a negative light. And we can't have that. And you've got materials training FBI agents and other counter-terror officials that actually say that there's a connection between Islam and terrorism. And we can't have that. And Brennan was absolutely right on the job. As a matter of fact, John Brennan wrote back immediately on White House stationery. Now, John Brennan did not have to go in and say, Barack, could I borrow a sheet of paper? He has his own stationery. But what he was doing was emphasizing the absolute high-level importance of what he was saying. That on White House stationery, John Brennan wrote back and said, yes, we will immediately fire all these Islamophobic trainers, and we will immediately cleanse all counter-terror training of any mention of Islam and Jihad in connection with terrorism, and any agents who have been trained by these people, we will re-educate. Chairman Mao would have been very pleased. <laughs> now, consider the implications of that. They immediately implemented it all. Consider what that means. That means that right now, the Obama administration is saying, we're going to vet these refugees, what are they vetting them for? Well, they're vetting them for connections to jihad terror groups. What's jihad terror? Oh, they don't know. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. As far as they're concerned, there is no connection between Islam and terrorism. That's the official policy of the United States government. And I suspect it's very close to, if not the official policy of the Canadian government. So, if Islam has nothing to do with terrorism, and you come to a fellow who does, for some reason, have a way to, for, to be known that he is very devout in Islam and active in his mosque or whatever. Well, anybody who's vetting is going to have to let that by, because that has nothing to do with terrorism. The other shooter in San Bernardino, Saeed Rizwan Farouk, he was very active in his mosque. And of course, as soon as he killed 14 people, his mosque says that he's shocked, they're shocked, shocked that he would have done this. You're winning, sir. And <laughs> it's the same thing when Islamic jihadis tried to kill, shoot up our event, our free speech event in Garland, Texas last May. 
And they had driven all the way from Phoenix uh, to Dallas to uh, kill us. And Ibrahim Simpson, one of the shooters there, was very active in the uh, Islamic Cultural Center of Phoenix. And he was even featured in some of its promotional videos and so on. And there again, the mosque said, we're shocked. How could this happen? How could he have misunderstood Islam? Well, obviously, there's something going on with the mosques that is not being recognized. There is jihad preaching going on in the mosques. And it's the, the authorities in Canada and the United States are completely ignoring it. As a matter of fact, the two refugees, as has been pointed out earlier, the two refugees, Tamerlan and Zohar Tsarnaev, who murdered several people at the Boston Marathon and wounded well over 100 with their bombs there, they were very active in the Islamic Society of Boston. And not long after the attack, the uh, head of the FBI at that time, Robert Mueller, was being questioned by uh, a congressman, the uh, great congressman from Texas, Louis Gohmert. And Gohmert was saying, are you aware that this mosque was attended by the Tsarnaev brothers and by Afia Siddiqui, who's doing 86 years for trying to murder Americans for Al-Qaeda, and Tarek Mahana, who's doing 17 years for working with Al-Qaeda, and Ahmed Abu Samra, who became the propagandist for the Islamic State, uh, responsible for a lot of their slick uh, social media presence and so on. Are you aware of all, were you aware of all that? Were you aware that it was founded by Adorkman al-Moudi, who's doing 23 years for financing Al-Qaeda? And Mueller said, well, uh, the, 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 and he said, did you go there? Had you investigated the mosque? And he said, oh yes, yes, we were there for outreach. <laughs> Well, you know what outreach means. Outreach means that they go to the mosque and they tell the Muslims there that they're not Islamophobic and that they are not focusing on Muslims when it comes to investigations of jihad terrorism. Because everybody knows that every religion can be susceptible to extremism and everyone can be radicalized and Amish are just as likely to set off bombs in crowded places as Muslims are. And everybody knows that. But this is the absurdity that we live with and that we are so accustomed to. The problem with the mosques only exacerbates the problem of vetting. Because obviously, when these people get here, then they're going to go to the mosques. At least some of them. A lot of the Islamic State guys are not. They're going to go to the strip clubs and fool the infidel and enjoy themselves in the process. But the mosques are not then going to make sure that these people are vetted or that the people who are troublesome are put out. We have no record of that. The Council on American Islamic Relations, which is of course the American uh, 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 source and counterpart to the National Council of Canadian Muslims, they have put out literature at, at, at their conferences telling people not to cooperate with the feds, not to aid counter-terror efforts. And they have opposed every counter-terror measure that comes down the pike. And so you have a comprehensive catastrophe that on the one hand, they're bringing these people in and they are, there, there are jihadis among them, or very likely to be jihadis among them. You have a jihad group boasting that there are jihadis among them, and jihadis among them already having struck in Paris. You have them coming in with the promise that they'll be vetted, and yet, there are no records to vet them by, and no reliable way to vet them, even if there were records, and even when there have been records, it's failed. And they come in, and they enter into the Islamic communities that have what nobody wants to talk about, a notoriously poor record of cooperating with efforts to weed out these people and make sure that they don't cause havoc. And so, at every step, of this catastrophic process, it's enforced. He's a moth. You have to believe in these absurd, absolutely counterfactual ideas, or you're rendered outside the realm of acceptable discourse. The idea that this is not going to have terrible consequences is unfortunately naive in the extreme. And the idea that this will never bear bitter fruit is ridiculous. 
So here we are in this situation. What can we do now? Well, unfortunately, the people who enforce all this absurdity and unreality control the government, the media, the educational system, the entertainment industry. Other than that, everything's great. <laughs> the only thing we have on our side, however, is the most powerful weapon of all, and that is the truth. And all this absurdity that is put out for us every day will increasingly show itself to be absurd. It cannot help it, because that's what it is. And the truth will out. It can't help it, because it is the truth. The truth is just reality. Reality cannot be hidden. Solzhenitsyn lived in a terrible totalitarian system that, that enforced upon its people with far greater brutality than we have here so far, and God forbid, I hope it never comes here, but they enforced upon their people all these absurd notions and unrealities on pain of death, and Solzhenitsyn likened it to a blade of grass covered over by the sidewalk, and the concrete presses down on you and blocks out all the light and kills you. Except, he pointed out, that even the blades of grass who are so much weaker than the concrete, they break the concrete and poke through. And the truth can never be hidden. Ultimately, every time they win, they lose. Every time that they win and bring over 25,000 jihadis and then 50,000 and more and more, not 25,000 jihadis, excuse me, 25,000 refugees, among whom there will most likely be jihadis. But you only need a few. It only took 19 to kill 3,000 people on 9-11. Anyway, every time they do that, they will not escape reality, and reality will strike. So unfortunately, the best that I can offer you is the fact that as things get worse, they will get better. Because as the consequences of these disastrous policies begin to show, then more people will wake up. <laughs> That's absolutely inevitable. And so we have every reason to have hope and confidence as long as we persevere and never give up. But I can tell you that uh, the pressures are only going to get worse because the thing about lies is that you have to keep repeating them to get them over. Remember how Goebbels said about the big lie, if you just keep repeating it enough, people will believe it. But also you have to keep repeating it because it's counterfactual. Because reality so contradicts it. You have to keep repeating it because reality, the, the blades of grass keep poking through the concrete. And so it's just like that now. That uh, they will keep on pressing all this absurdity upon us. And they're never going to stop. And it's only going to get worse. I used to have no trouble getting across the Canadian border, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is the last time I see you in your lovely country. Because if I'm detained three hours on suspicion of hate speech now, after Trudeau's only been in a little while, well, what's going to be the year after he's been, uh, uh, there have been all, all sorts of strategies drawn up to make sure that uh, these kinds of things are not allowed? I mean, I hope to be back, but I'm not, <laughs> yes, I'll say I'm a Syrian refugee. <laughs> that, yes, so, but the point is, you know, it's obviously not just about me. It's about the increasing pressures that will be brought to bear to try to enforce their lives upon us. And so it is up to all of us. And insofar as you become an activist, remember that you know people aren't born activists and people aren't uh, elected to be the next activist. And I never thought I was going to be doing this. You know, I'd rather be playing the saxophone. But I used to play, but <laughs> luckily you're spared that. But anyway. It's up to all of us. Nobody's going to do this for us. And you can have tremendous influence in your own spheres, with your own talents and your own time, to influence those around you. And it is incumbent upon us to do this now. The stakes are very high. But remember that even no matter how hard things get, there's just no way we can lose this. Because there's no way that they are going to enforce this unreality upon us and drown out the truth forever. It can't be done. Thank you very much.